I would really like to hear um, uh, more about your process with Jill in Artistic Fraud. So I've chosen After Image because mm -hmm. it's one that a lot of the audience will know about and it won the GG. So it's also a literary achievement as well as being a theatrical achievement. Can you just talk about like, how did it begin? And then what, how did you carry it through? Sure. Um, the shows kind of all start in different places. I mean, the, ultimately the genesis of the show start with either myself or Jill and usually one of us, like usually the other person has to kind of come on board. Um, not necessarily be convinced, but but to come on board, you know, Jill will come to me with an idea at a Christmas party drunkenly and say, <laughs> we should do this show with a big sheet. Or, or I will come to her and say, you know, I, I think, you know, all this timing stuff we're doing is really interesting. Now, what if we put a big video screen behind me and I was timed so specifically to the score of the video that I could actually match the video without looking at it. That was that be belly cool? up, right? That was belly up. Right. And so that idea was mine. And, and, and Jill keeps reminding me of that fact because it was a really hard show to do. <laughs> and I complained about it as an actor. She's like, it was your idea. Um, and, you know, oil and water came from me. And uh, after image came from her. Uh, she had met, uh, Michael Crummy uh, and her had met when they both did the Labrador Creative Arts Festival, which is this amazing children, I've heard about amazing, it. Yeah, amazing, amazing, amazing children's festival in, in, uh, based in Goose Bay, Labrador, where they bring in um, incredible professional artists from all over the country and sometimes internationally to, uh, to work in a non-competitive setting on this theater festival with kids. So there's the kids create their shows from all over Labrador, bring them into Goose Bay, do them in the evenings. It's non-competitive. There's an adjudicator there that does workshops with them. And then through the day, uh, all the schools and all the students get um, workshops in all the disciplines with these amazing artists, right? So Jill was up there doing uh, a workshop on stuff and this guy, Michael Crummy, who was originally from Newfoundland but was living in Kingston at the time, was up there working on short stories with the kids. And Jill was really nervous on planes um, at the time. She's gotten better at that. And uh, as she was getting on the plane to fly home, Michael said, hey, well, here's, here's my book of short stories. Why don't you read that on your way home? You know, try to calm you down. And uh, I may even picked her up from the airport and she got off the plane and said, this guy is a genius. He's gotta be huge. <laughs> it's like, okay, she said, you have to read this. Uh, and there was a book called Hard Light and Michael had taken all of these um, these memories and recollections from his family and, and turned them into these beautiful little prose poems. I've read it. Gorgeous, yeah, gorgeous. It's amazing. Uh, and just recently turned into an absolutely stunning, stunning documentary by a filmmaker Justin Sims here with Michael in it. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous work. Um, Jill completely fell in love with, with Michael's writing and Michael because he's the sweetest guy. <laughs> like, he's just such a beautiful person. And um, and so there started a collaboration outside of myself and Jill's collaboration. That collaboration started and we, we did a staged version of Hard Light uh, for one night at the Ellsbury Hall. And then that, that uh, evolved into a piece called Salvage that uh, used some of the Hard Light pieces, but also pieces from Michael's uh, poetic work Salvage that we staged in a house here in mm -hmm. St. John's and kind of did this walking tour of a house when you'd encounter the characters right. from this family's life. So we had a relationship, myself and Jill had a relationship with Michael and his work and we were both big fans by this point. And she had, from the, from very early on, probably before we've done Salvage, she had read a book of his called Flesh and Blood, one of his earlier short story collections. And in it was this story, After Image. And Jill said, we have to do something with this someday. It's incredible, it's incredible. And she got me to read it. And I was like, yeah, it's good. But sure, okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, a beautiful story. I don't know why it has to be a piece of theater. And, you know, we had a meeting with Michael. And Michael was like, thanks. I don't know why it had to be a piece of theater. Like, I don't know what you, why is this? And I had to agree with him. I just didn't see it. And, and she was like, no, it's a play. There's a play in there. And, and so to say I had to be convinced is a bit strong. I mean, I was in. Jill wanted to do it and it was Michael. I was totally in. Um, but I had to, uh, I had to read it a lot and have a lot of conversations with Jill to get as excited about it as she was about right. it. Um, and for Jill, the excitement was the direct link between the imagery that Michael had incorporated in that story and the narrative. Thematically, how he linked uh, what was happening in the narrative with the actual imagery in the show. That this is a story about connection and human belonging um, and feeling connected or disconnected from people that was just filled with all this imagery of fire and electricity and shocking. And so Jill said, this is just like this does this is this is fantastic it's ripe for the theater and so far as i can manifest that fire and the electricity literally on stage and i can literally manifest that metaphor that michael has so beautifully layered in here right 
And once I got, that's what she was trying to do. I was like, yeah, that's really, so you're talking oh, about okay. putting, she, I'm talking about putting like copper wires all over the floor. I'm talking about like sparks, like people touching the walls and spark and creating fire and fire. Like I was like, great, okay, let's do it. So, um, so then began the process of me taking this story away that, you know, exists in five, six pages and trying to make it into an hour and a half long play. And I think that was the first time I'd ever done that. Um, and it was really challenging and really fun. The scariest part of it, of course, was um, we, we both decided very, very early on that we wanted to keep some of Michael's actual text in the play because the, the text is so beautiful. So why get rid of it? But then the challenge becomes that, you know, there's going to be 10% Michael's text, 90% mine, but my 90% has to match his 10%. I know. Like it has to feel like a Michael Crummy story still. It has to feel uh, true to that. That was terrifying. And uh, and also within the story, there was this, uh, you know, it's a very lean little story and, and about this family. And so at one point he mentions, you know, um, Leo has a brother and sister, Teresa and Jerome. And he kind of mentions them and says, you know, they were also peculiar like their mother. And that's all he says. But like, if they're going to exist on stage, they need a life. They need a, a pattern of thinking and, and being in the world and relationships. And so flushing all that stuff out was really fun. And right. I remember when Michael was right. reading the drafts as they were coming through going, wow, <laughs> where did that come from? You know, because I made, I made, I because uh, he talks very briefly about Jerome and Teresa, like having this weirdness that their mother possesses and this being ostracized by the community. So I made... I made Teresa, because there's all this storm imagery in the show, I made Teresa be able to predict the weather. That was her kind okay. of gift that she had. And and Jerome became this kid that always, because um, there's all this visual imagery, people seeing things. I made uh, Jerome this kid that saw through closed eyes. So he always looked at things with his eyes closed and saw things deeper. Um, so, so stuff like that. So that yeah. was really fun to play on what Michael had there and build that out. So I wrote a first draft. Uh, that Michael wasn't, you know, we questioned Michael on it. Michael was like hands off. He's like, yeah, this, you know, you do whatever you want. He was really, really great. Um, we uh, we developed a relationship with Iris Turcott. I had been developing with relation with Iris Turcott, um, who had just started at the factory at that point, I think. Um, so she came on and worked on the the production draft of that show with me. Uh, made some incredible discoveries, like I, because you know the the story takes place in this town, so I had all this cross casting and stuff happening. A really peculiar moment when when there's a there's a, a character in it. The Iris kept saying she's a ghost, she's a ghost, and I was like, I don't want to make it like a, ooh, I don't want to make her a ghost. And Iris couldn't explain it more than that, but she said it's a ghost, it's a ghost. And when we finally fleshed out the idea and figured it out. Um, it was a notion that this character was kind of haunting the play and was ever present. As a character, that you right. know, because previous to that, the actress would play that character and then play other other characters, and so once I I figured out what Iris meant by it's a ghost and it's haunting the play, and that she had to be there, we had to see her as that character, and I went, well, if I'm doing it for her, I'm doing it for the rest. It's so an all. It became. We went from being a 23 character show played by eight people to being an eight character show. So this narrative in this town was seen through the eyes of these eight people which is a real leap forward for me, not only in that show, but in just how I looked about storytelling and narrative. Right, right. Um, so we went through that process with Iris, and then we did the show for the first time at Toronto at the Harbourfront Centre. Um, huge uh, technical leap forward in terms of how the electricity and everything worked. Huge deep learning curve on, on how, what parts of that were clear and what weren't. And after that, we, uh, we had, on the previous show that we'd done, Fear of Flight, we developed this... Um, this notion of doing post-production dramaturgy with Sarah Stanley, oh. who now works with Jill at, at the NAC. Um, and that we'd bring Sarah, we brought Sarah in to watch Fear of Flight um, because we knew there was stuff at the show that we wanted to fix, but we just didn't have enough perspective on it. So we brought our dramaturg in to see the production and to dramaturge the production, light, sound, everything. And Sarah's a perfect person for that because she's also a director. And, and so we did that and it worked wonders for us on Fear of Flight. So we did it again on After Image. Um, you know, reconvened about six months after the original production and looked at videotapes, looked at the script anew, looked at how the electricity was working and adjusted the text and other elements to kind of work in concert a bit more. Right. Um, things that you'd never think when you're writing the play, when you're writing a play that you know is going to have a vocal score, you'd never think, well, you don't need to say that line because the music is already doing that. Oh, okay. You know, you don't need yeah. to tell us that he was sad because the music that Jonathan's composed there is already sad. You just need to state that one line and then let the music do the rest. And 
completely eye-opening right. leap forward for the show. And um, and so then we, we redid the show in uh, June of 2010 here in St. John's. And that process uh, of um, that process of me working with Iris quite closely, original production with Jill, right. um, back into uh, workshops with Sarah and production. It also, we went through with Oil and Water, and we'll also be doing with upcoming productions. It was a dream. It really, really worked well for us. And do you sometimes feel that uh, when you're doing the rewrites that you, you that you're losing something? Like, do you feel like? Oh, like, I wish I didn't have to lose that. Or are you more about the whole piece and if it improves the whole piece as uh, It doesn't ever come to that for me. It doesn't. Okay. No, particularly with Sarah, with the section with Sarah, what you mean, in terms of sacrificing things? Yeah. To, it never comes to that to me because you've already, for me, we're all on the same page insofar as we've seen right. the, we've seen the full production and we know what we're going for now. Yes, okay. Um, there was a, there was a real, like, After Image, the big shift that happened in After Image, I remember, and I was so excited when I made this discovery. Because there's all these chorus lines, these choral lines that happen in the show where um, the characters pop out of character and talk to us directly as an audience. Because they pop out of, uh, they break the fourth wall and talk to us. And uh, essentially become chorus. And they enter at chorus at the beginning and they talk about the story they're about to tell and um, Brechtian kind of chorus stuff. And uh, so, a, so, um, yeah, so in this moment in the show, like we were constantly looking at who would be because that, and that's where Michael's text ultimately got preserved. That's where the third person narration stuff that okay. was in the story got yeah. preserved was in that chorus work, and that's why we decided to do it that way. And so it was in a lot of the scenes that this chorus, this these chorus lines were there, and the process of going through with Sarah, having seen the show now, was deciding who, which character is it best to say that because it was almost arbitrary the first time around. Maybe not arbitrary, but like it felt arbitrary. Uh, who was who was actually speaking these lines? So we got really, really specific with Sarah. Who was the best person to do it? In the middle of the play, there is this flashback. Um, you know, it's about a mother and and her son that you you come to realize that the son's adopted. He feels very disconnected from his family, and that a part of that is due to him being adopted, and he's never known that. And there's a flashback about three quarters of the way through the show where you see. Uh, the moment of Lee's the mother working at a hospital where this young uh, pregnant unwed mother comes in has a baby and dies mm -hmm. and that Lee's ends up adopting this child and that's Leo that's you find out that's her son um, but in the middle of that like Michael has Michael has all these beautiful lines about about, about you know her pregnancy and, and, and how things are going horrible and um, so I wanted to preserve that stuff and that went in the chorus lines and it became like well who says that who actually says those lines and we really, we, we spent a full day on trying to figure out because it was really peculiar. Uh, and right before she has the baby, uh, Lise is reading the fortune, she's a fortune teller. She's reading the fortune of Connie, the young mother. And then I had this idea, well, what if Lise reads her own lines? What if the, the chorus lines in this section are actually the prediction? Oh, she actually tells okay. the young mother that she's going she's gonna to die in childbirth. childbirth. And so that's what happens. So she starts the prediction and it turns into the birth and she keeps talking like it's a prediction even oh, though she's wow. in the middle of it. And it was a huge eye-opening discovery and it came about because of that process with Sarah and knowing how it was going to be staged and knowing who was going to be on stage right. and who was playing music. All that stuff really informed it. So it never really comes down to... Um, those discoveries are way more frequent than right. the discoveries where I feel like I have to cut a line because it's not working with something. Yeah. Um, Oil and water was oil and water was 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 challenging in that process because there was a storyline that that took some adjusting that you know that Sarah was really intent on, on me looking at and I took some convincing for me to budge on it. Right. Um, but once I did, she was right. <laughs> hate uh, that. Yeah, I hate when they're right. <laughs> she was right. Uh, right. Uh, so you know, it's never. I, I don't mean to imply that it's an easy process. No. Um, but. Um, it's hugely beneficial, and because again, like I say, like myself and Jill grew up uh, in the theater together. That we, we, you know, collaborative making these plays together. That once they hit the stage, we both stand back from them and go, "It's not, it's not, it's not working," you know. Yeah. And and sometimes, you know, sometimes Sarah will look across the table and go, "The text here is great. You need to fix what's happening on stage." Like that happens just as often. Right. Um, and the music sometimes it goes to the music as well, so I don't feel singled out. Okay. <laughs> 